Okay, good. Um, appears to be working. Okay, uh, sorry about that. So what I wanted to do today is finish our discussion of the theory of symmetries in quantum mechanics. And in particular, finish our uh, discussion of theories with uh, Lorentz symmetry. That is to say, the discussion of theories with symmetry relevant for special relativity. And so um, the way that I'm going to proceed is I'm going to finish our discussion of the formal theory of uh, Hilbert spaces, which are invariant under the symmetries of special relativity. And then later on in this course, we'll return to the subject of relativistic quantum mechanics and put some of this knowledge uh, to use. So roughly the last week and a half of this course will be concerned with relativistic quantum mechanics, where we'll be putting to use all of the knowledge that we uh, developed last class and uh, will be developing today in our discussion of sort of the formal uh, theory of uh, systems with uh, uh, boost and rotation invariants. So um, just to remind you of a few things that we discussed last time, okay. um, the symmetries of special relativity are Lorentz symmetries. And just as rotation symmetries are changes of your coordinate axes in three dimensions, which preserve the lengths of vectors, the Lorentz symmetries are uh, changes of coordinates uh, that mix our space and time coordinates. So T and Xi, but preserve not the length of vectors, but the invariant interval of a four vector. So S, which is defined as minus T squared plus the length of the vector X squared, or as X mu, X nu, eta mu nu, where mu and nu are indices that run from zero up to three, and X mu is the four vector whose components are the time and the space directions. So just as rotations are rotations of the three coordinate axes, x1, x2, and x3, that preserve the length of the vector x, Lorentz transformations are rotations or changes of the four axes, t, x1, x2, and x3, that preserve the invariant interval minus t squared plus x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Okay. And they are generated by uh, the differential operators that we call j mu nu, which are defined as x mu d by d x nu minus x nu d by d x mu. Okay. And this uh, is supposed to be familiar to you because it's highly reminiscent of the differential operators that generate rotations. So for example, uh, we would define uh, the rotation generator J3 as I uh, Y D by D X, or I guess it's X D by D Y, I never quite remember which, minus Y D by D X. Okay. And so this is just a simple generalization of this to accommodate rotations that mix space and time as well, so that mix time as well as space. And the only subtlety is that there are certain funny minus signs that appear that we worked out in some detail last class. Um, and these are accommodated in this definition by the notation where I use the uh, matrix eta mu nu to raise and lower indices. So that, for example, x mu is defined as x uh, as, say, eta mu alpha x alpha. So what is that? That's the vector which has as its components not t and to the xi's, but minus t and to the xi's. Because eta mu nu is just the diagonal matrix with entries minus 1, 1, 1, and 1. Okay. So these generators j mu nu obey some algebra that's easy enough to work out. 
But that algebra is easier to understand if we recast it in a language that is familiar to us from our discussion of the rotation group. So to that end, we define Ji as epsilon i j k. Here, I'll be neurotic about my indices, why not? J k, j sub j k, where i, j, and k are indices that run from one up to three. And this is the usual generator of spatial rotations. And ki is the generator of a boost in the i direction And it is really these ki's that are the novel ingredient in the theory of uh, special relativity as opposed to that of Newtonian physics. So remember in our discussion of Galilean symmetries of Newtonian physics, we had the Galilean boosts, which were the coordinate transformations where x goes to x plus vt. That's just the coordinate transformation that corresponds to going to a frame that's moving at some constant velocity with respect to some rest frame. Here, that's replaced in the theory of special relativity by this Lorentz boost. That is, we, uh, I reminded you of its structure uh, last class. And these uh, Lorentz transformations generate an algebra which is reasonably uh, easy to understand. So the j's generate the usual rotation algebra. k transforms as a vector, so that tells us how j and k uh, commute. And the commutator of k's gives you a j, which is the remarkable statement that if you do two Lorentz transformations, uh, then you end up with a rotation. Um, in fact, it's, an, it's a fun exercise to go through and prove that to yourselves, just using the explicit formulas for uh, the Lorentz transformations. OK. So in order to make the theory of Lorentz sym symmetries a little bit more transparent, I considered the following linear combinations of rotations and boosts. And then we noticed that the algebra of Lorentz symmetries becomes just two copies of the rotation algebra, SU2. In particular, the commutator of Ni with Nj is the usual epsilon ijk, Nk. And likewise, um, for the n daggers, and n and n dagger commute. So if you want to describe how a uh, object transforms under the rotation group, that is to say, if you want to write down a Hilbert space where all of the Lorentz generators are realized as unitary operators acting on that Hilbert space, then all you need to do is go ahead and apply exactly the same machinery that we developed in our discussion of Hilbert spaces that were invariant under the rotation group. Okay. And in particular, representations of the Lorentz group are given by pairs of representations of the rotation group. So um, what we usually do is we usually give a name to these two rotation algebras. We call the ends the generators of SU2 left, and the n daggers the generators of SU2 right. Okay. Uh, one thing to note about this expression is that the parity transformation, x goes to minus x, takes j to itself, but takes k to minus k. So parity interchanges ni and ni dagger. 
And so it interchanges left and right. Okay? That's why we call them left and right. Uh, when you reflect things in a mirror, left and right get interchanged. And so this means that we can now understand completely how uh, particles with spin are described in special relativity. So in special relativity, there are really two different kinds of particles with spin. This is something that I went over a little quickly at the end of class last time, so let me just reiterate it again now. Um, there are particles with left-handed spin and particles with right-handed spin. Uh, so, for example, if you take the Hilbert space, so the total Hilbert space of your, of some system that is rotationally invariant has to be the tensor product of some representation that transforms under SU2 left. So let's call it H left times some representation that transforms under SU2 right. So that's the general structure of some quantum mechanical Hilbert space that will be invariant under uh, the transformations of special relativity. And for example, a left-handed spinner, which, is, which we would usually denote, uh, say, 1 half comma 0, would be given by a Hilbert space where you have the spin 1 half representation for the NIs and the spin 0 representation for the NI daggers. So this would describe a left-handed spinner. And we usually call it a while spinner for historical reasons, whereas the opposite case where you have a system which does not, tr which transforms trivially under the NIs, but not under the NI daggers would be a right-handed while spinner. And as I commented uh, last time, this means that in describing systems that are invariant under the transformations of special relativity, it's possible to write down spin one half, uh, you know, systems of spin one half particles that are not invariant under parity, okay? Because left and right-handed spinners can be treated differently, okay? This is unlike in Newtonian physics. And indeed, um, it is this freedom which allows one to write down uh, theories of physics which are not invariant under parity that involve these spin one-half particles. And as you uh, hopefully know, we're all built out of spin one-half particles, protons, neutrons, electrons, and so forth. And it is this freedom to write down, to treat left and right-handed spinners differently that in the standard model uh, allows for parity violation. Okay. So this allows for parity violation. Uh, in theories of particle physics. In particular, one can write, certainly write down theories where uh, you know, an elect a left-handed version of the electron would be treated differently from a right-handed version of the electron. The other thing um, that I should point out is that the dimensions of these Hilbert spaces describing the left and right-handed spinners, these are all two-dimensional Hilbert spaces, okay? Um, because they're the tensor product of a two-dimensional Hilbert space and a one-dimensional Hilbert space. Okay. So if you wanted to understand, just, just to bring things a little bit down to earth, to tell you exactly how Lorentz transformations act on these Hilbert spaces. So for example, on the Hilbert space of the left-handed while spinner, Uh, and I, which is J I plus I K I, it acts, is represented by a Pauli matrix. 
as usual, and an I dagger uh, is just represented by the trivial matrix, one. So that tells you exactly how a rotation and a boost will be realized as a unitary operator on this Hilbert space. So the infinitesimal generators, J and K, are represented by uh, the poly matrices uh, uh, acting. Um, so they're represented by either the poly matrix or the identity matrix. And in order to obtain the unitary operators, we just exponentiate those as usual. And if you remember, in our discussion of spin one-half systems in uh, Newtonian physics, I wrote down explicit formulas for how you exponentiate these poly matrices. So at this point, if I told you to write down the Hilbert space of a while spinner, uh, either left-handed or right-handed in quantum mechanics, you could tell me exactly how it is that uh, boosts and rotations will act on the Hilbert space as some unitary operators. Is that clear? Are there any uh, questions about that? Yes? Well, I just want to know, does the spirit violation only show up when you put it in the cube? Uh, uh, yes, so in, in fact, it turns out that although nature is parity violating, these effects are fantastically small. Um, I think that um, the dimensionless parameter that controls the size of parity violation, violating effects in the standard model is something like 10 to the minus 20. Okay. Um, so uh, indeed, uh, it's, extremely, it's extremely small. Um, it turns out, although uh, uh, this is beyond the scope of what we're going to study in this course. Um, the the model, standard model of particle physics. So um, I also haven't described to you uh, how other discrete symmetries act on these Hilbert spaces. Um, so you should also uh, think a little bit about how time reversal symmetry acts on these Hilbert spaces. Okay. So um, this is a good exercise for you uh, to test your knowledge of these various discrete symmetries. So figure out what happens to these representations under time reversal symmetry. Okay. And it actually turns out that in uh, the standard model of particle physics, um, it's not parity itself that is violated. It turns out that it's only the combination um, parity reversal, time reversal, and uh, charge conjugation, which is uh, preserved, sorry. I might have said so. So the combination of parity, time reversal, and charge conjugation is preserved in nature. But C, P, and T individually are not. I think I may have accidentally stated, said the reverse, but I haven't had enough coffee, coffee yet. Um, And so uh, the typical uh, size of the violation of one of these things is fantastically tiny, though. And you're right, of course, that it is, uh, for example, uh, they, won't be, it wouldn't, they won't be violated in um, uh, non-relativistic systems. And so the strength of these violations is controlled, among other things, by these relativistic gamma factors, OK, V squareds over C squareds. Um, but even though C, P, and T violation is very small, of course, it has been observed and has been tested um, in many different uh, contexts. Um, just as a historical aside, I should mention that it's the violation of C, P, and T that is responsible for all matter in the universe. Okay. Um, so uh, you may have heard of antimatter. Okay, what is antimatter? Antimatter is exactly the same as matter, but it has opposite charge. So the obvious question that one would ask oneself is um, how is it possible uh, that there is apparently more matter in our universe than antimatter? Okay, we, we're all made of matter, but antimatter is, appears only uh, in very special uh, cases or on Star Trek. Um, and so uh, you might ask, why is antimatter so rare and why is matter so abundant? And the answer is that matter and antimatter are not treated the same way in the standard model of particle physics. Um, there are processes where matter is created preferentially to antimatter. And so it's believed that the reason why there's matter in the universe and not antimatter, by and large, is because in the very early universe, um, uh, the, you know, we, the, the universe was some soup of particles at finite temperature, and there were various uh, out of equilibrium processes which allowed matter to dominate over antimatter. And it's only because 
charge conservation, you know, the C symmetry where matter and antimatter switch roles is not respected in the standard model of particle physics. And it's an open problem, actually, in particle physics to understand exactly how that occurred. Because if you combine the models of particle physics, where these charge violations and P and T violations all are very, very tiny, they're a part in 10 to the 20, um, if you combine that with our models of the early universe, then we really don't understand. It, apparently, uh, you, can't, you can explain why there's more matter than antimatter, but you can't explain why there's so much more matter than antimatter. So it's right qualitatively, but it doesn't seem to work out in terms of the details. So some people try and understand this uh, by modifying the model. Some people think that this is a clue as to how we should un modify uh, our current models of particle physics. That was not at all. I don't know if I answered your question. I don't remember what your question was. OK, good. Um, sorry, uh, got a little distracted there. Any other questions? OK. Um, there are other uh, sorts of representations, of course, that one can construct of the Lorentz group. So for example, you could consider a system where you have both a, here, how should I write this? A system where you have both a spin one half, a left-handed spinner, a left-handed while spinner, and a right-handed while spinner. So this is a, so this is something we would call one half comma, this is something uh, that would be a uh, four-dimensional Hilbert space. And this is uh, something that you would want to consider if you wanted to consider a particle with spin that was parity invariant. Because you could take parity to interchange uh, the left and the right-handed parts of this Hilbert space. So this can be parity invariant. Of course, saying whether it could be parity invariant, one would have to actually write down a Hamiltonian and see if it commuted with the operation of parity. But if it did, meaning that it interchanged these two tensor product factors, then that could be some parity invariant description of a spin one half particle. And indeed, this was the first description of a spin one half particle that was understood in quantum mechanics. It's what's known as a Dirac spinner. And uh, the theory of Dirac spinners is something that we'll spend uh, about the last week of this course studying. Um, and that will be our first real taste of relativistic quantum mechanics in action. Question. What would it mean to have um, a Hilbert space of spin one half plus left handed? What does it mean? It means that it's a four dimensional uh, Hilbert space. And it means that. Um, so like, not this, right? Uh, this is a four dimensional Hilbert space because this is two plus two, commonly yeah. believed to be four. Um, but I, I'm not asking yeah. about this. Oh, you mean the one half, one half? That's what I was going to get to next. OK, good. Also, the thing which transforms a spin one half in both sides is parity invariant. OK. That's also a four dimensional Hilbert space. Uh, can anyone guess what that is? What four-dimensional object can you think of that transforms under Lorentz transformations? I can wait as long as you can. We've already discussed it today. What you're looking for is a four-dimensional vector space, okay, which is acted on by uh, Lorentz transformations as uh, unitary operators. This is a four, okay. This is a four vector. Indeed, for example, this is the Hilbert space that we would use to describe a photon. Okay. So, so a photon, for example, if you wish to describe the quantum mechanical states of a photon, they'll live in this Hilbert space. So uh, the theory of quantized radiation is actually um, a very important theory uh, in physics. Indeed, it was by considering this theory that Planck originally discovered 
the so-called ultraviolet catastrophe, which led him to uh, the consideration of quantum mechanics and Planck's constant and quantization in the first place. Okay, so historically, and of course in nature, it's a very important uh, thing to consider. Um, it's not something that I'm gonna consider in this class um, because it gets a little bit technical, um, but um, I certainly could if, if we wanted, if we had enough time. And of course, there are many other um, sorts of representations that one can uh, write down. So for example, there are higher dimensional representations that would represent the uh, quantum mechanical Hilbert space of say, some um, excited particle which has a higher spin than just spin one half of uh, say a fermion or uh, the four vector of a photon um, there are also, so for example, if you want to describe the states of a graviton, or if you wanted to describe the states of some collect collective excitation of, of a bunch of electrons bound together. Okay, so just as in non-relativistic physics, you could take two electrons bound together to have something that's spin one, or three electrons that's bound, bound together that has spin three halves, or something like that. Um, in uh, particle physics experiments, it's very often the case that you can create bound states of electrons, protons, neutrons, and so forth that have higher spin. And if you look at the particle data book, you know, uh, it's about that thick. And it's a list of all of the different sorts of resonances that one can construct, some of which have very high spin. Okay. So for example, I think in your uh, problem set that's due on Wednesday, you're going to use the theory of symmetries to come up with a prediction uh, for the masses of certain higher spin states um, in uh, particle physics, okay. using what's known as isospin. That's fun. Good. Um, okay. Any other questions before I continue? Okay. Good. Um, I would like to uh, conclude our discussion um, with one final um, uh, uh, set of ideas. So um, it's important to remember that just as in Newtonian physics, we were interested in systems that were not just rotationally invariant, but also translationally invariant. That gave us the Galilean group, which was the full set of symmetries of Newtonian physics. The full set of symmetries of special relativity includes both boosts so uh, Lorentz transformations which include boosts and rotations and translations. So just as we had the Lorentz boosts, so what do I call them, sigma and rho, which obey some complicated algebra that I wrote down last time. We also should include here the generators of translations. So what are the generators of translations? Well, the generators of translations are described by a four-dimensional vector who's labeled by an index mu that runs from zero up to three. So what is this? This is d by i times d by dx mu. I guess conventionally we call it i h bar times d by dx mu, okay? So explicitly, what does it include? Well, i h bar d by dt, as well as i h bar d by dx i. Okay. So this is the four vector, which has as its components, this four operators, one of which is the generator of time translations, of course, which is the Hamiltonian, and the rest of which are the generators of the spatial translations, that is to say, the various uh, momentum operators in quantum mechanics. So the algebra of all of the full symmetries of special relativity includes uh, not only the algebra of the Lorentz generators, J mu nu, but also the algebra of these translations. So of course, two translations will commute with one another in special relativity, just as they would in um, Newtonian physics. But J mu nu will not commute with one of these translations. 
Why is that? Well, the translations form a vector, and just as in three dimensions, what vectors do for a living is transform under rotations. In special relativity, what a four vector does for a living is it transforms under the Lorentz transformations. And so there's some formula here. So I'll just write it down, not because I want you to know it, but just because I want you to sort of uh, understand schematically what it looks like. So there's some formula here which says that the action of a Lorentz transformation on a four vector is another four vector. So just like if you take a rotation and you act on a three vector and it gives you another vector, so that means that infinitesimally, the commutator of a rotation generator with a translation generator is another translation generator. Here we have the commutator of a Lorentz symmetry with a four, trans of the, the four momentum, p mu, is going to be proportional, is going to be some sort of uh, four momentum. Okay. And there's some particular index structure and some eta mu nus uh, that live here um, that um, encapsulate uh, all of the details of that algebra. So um, it turns out that um, the representation theory of this algebra is much more complicated than that of the rotation group or even uh, the Galilean group. And this rotation theory was first worked out, I believe, by uh, Eugene Wigner in the 1930s. And um, I don't want to go through the details of the theory of Hilbert spaces that are acted on by unitary operators obeying this algebra. But I just want to emphasize to you that if we did go through and solve that problem, then we would have completely classified all possible particles that could appear in nature uh, provided nature is invariant under the symmetries of special relativity. Okay. So maybe what I'll do is I will just describe to you a few features of the answer to this question, okay. what these Hilbert spaces look like. And that'll give you at least a flavor for how it is we classify all possible particles uh, in uh, nature um, uh, using uh, the symmetries of special relativity. So unlike uh, Newtonian physics, special relativity uh, is, as far as we know, uh, completely and precisely correct. And so the answer, uh, so by understanding the Hilbert spaces that are acted on by unitary operators corresponding to these translations and Lorentz transformations gives us, as far as we know, uh, a completely correct way of classifying all of the fundamental particles of nature. Now, of course, it doesn't give us all of the information. It's believed that there are other symmetries relevant in nature, as well as their complicated interactions. So uh, you can't use this to determine exactly what the Hamiltonian of nature is. But you can use this uh, technology to determine at least what the allowed Hilbert spaces are of the fundamental particles in nature. Okay. So um, let me just tell you a few features of this theory. Okay. So as we've seen uh, in our theory of the rotation group, a useful way of describing the Hilbert spaces is to find operators that are Casimirs, that is to say operators that commute with all of the generators of this rotation group. So let's ask a question to see if you're all paying attention. Can anyone name for me uh, a Casimir of this group? OK. Can anyone name for me another Casimir of this group? I'll give you a hint. It's quadratic in these generators. We have j mu nu, and we have p mu. Can anyone think of something quadratic in those generators, which will be invariant under translations as well as under Lorentz symmetries? Let's see how well you remember your special relativity. I know, so, I know at least some of you are taking my special relativity class and have no excuse. Any guesses? No guesses? 
You all just haven't woken up yet. Okay. So... This combination, P mu, P mu, or P mu, P nu, eta mu nu. So what is that? Well, remember that P mu is the vector, I guess I drew it with a lower index, which contains the Hamiltonian, or the energy, as well as the momentum vector. This combination is E squared minus P squared, uh, I'm using, so it's the difference of the square of the energy and the square of the momentum vector of a particle in special relativity. Uh, as I said last time, I'm using here uh, units where c is equal to 1. So if I were using units where c is not equal to 1, I would have to use dimensional analysis in order to insert uh, some factors of c squared uh, to make everything uh, work out dimensionally. And as you hopefully remember from your special relativity classes, this particular combination of energy and momentum has a name. Okay. It's m squared c to the fourth, okay. i.e. it's the rest mass of an object. So, in special relativity, just as space and time individually have no separate meaning, uh, but the invariant interval t squ x squared minus t squared uh, has meaning, energy and momentum of an object depend on the frame in which they are measured. But the combination e squared minus p squared does not depend on the frame in which it's measured. Uh, in particular, the relativistic uh, energy of an object is given by m squared c to the fourth plus p squared c squared. So that, for example, if the object is not moving and the momentum vector is equal to zero, this gives you the famous relation E equals mc squared of an object at rest. And this formula then, uh, that E squared minus p squared is equal to m squared up to some factors of c, is the statement of how that formula is modified for a moving object. Okay. Is this statement familiar to everyone? Okay. Uh, does everyone remember? No? Did someone say no? Would you like me to elaborate on this statement for just a minute? Or is this familiar? Okay. okay. So one of the remarkable things that we have noticed is that um, just as in uh, the theory of the Galilean uh, group, which we worked out earlier, the uh, mass of an object, the mass of a particle, is not some mysterious parameter that comes out of nowhere, but it's actually something that just pops out of the symmetry structure of special relativity. When you try and write down Hilbert spaces, which can be acted on by the symmetries of special relativity, you naturally find that these Hilbert spaces come in families, and they're labeled by a continuous parameter, which is basically the mass of the object. It turns out that there is a second, uh, second um, Casimir, okay, which is totally not obvious, which is the square of the vector w, So I'll just write down its formula for you. So J here is the generator of Lorentz transformations. P is the generator of translations. And that epsilon with four indices is the thing that is equal to one or minus one if its four indices are an even or odd permutation of zero, one, two, three, and is equal to zero otherwise. So I remind you that in the theory of rotations, one of the quadratic Casimirs was J squared. Um, and so this is sort of the analog of J squared in special relativity. Okay. And the representations, that is to say the Hilbert spaces, 
that can arise in theories with Lorentz symmetry are then characterized by the possible values of these Casimirs, p squared and w squared. Okay. So I'll just tell you what the answer is. Okay. This is what was worked out by Wigner. So there's one family of representations where p squared is a number which is bigger than 0, and w squared is that same number times s times s plus 1, where here m squared is a continuous number between 0 and infinity, and s is a half integer. And um, this tells us that in this family, we're studying an object with a mass whose square is positive and which has a half integer spin. So among other things, this is why nothing travels faster than the speed of light. Remember that in order for an object to travel faster than the speed of light, its mass squared would have to be negative. Are you guys familiar with that statement? This is why nobody believed the opera experiment last year, which said that, uh, neutr that um, neutrino, what was it, uh, muons traveled faster than, it was neutrinos, it was neutrinos traveled faster than the speed of light. Um, because um, among other things, it's not consistent with the symmetries of special relativity and quantum mechanics. Okay. Because among other things, they imply that the mass squared of something has to be greater than or equal to zero. Okay. So here we have a, family of representations parameterized by a continuous parameter, the mass, and by a discrete parameter, the spin, which takes half integer values. And the other representation that we have describes uh, particles with zero mass, and it turns out that other parameter is zero as well. And it turns out that there's also uh, a half integer that describes these families. Okay. So it turns out that p mu is always proportional to w mu in these representations. And so s here is a number that's again half integer. And uh, the plus or minus that appears here has a name. We call that the helicity of the representation. So for example, this is the representation that would describe a photon. So when s is equal to 1, uh, we have something with mass squared 0. And there are actually two possible states of the photon with opposite helicity, okay, with the plus or the minus sign in this formula. And it turns out that there are other representations But as far as we know, these are not realized in nature. And so um, what we've done here is given a complete classification of all possible Hilbert spaces of objects consistent with the laws of special relativity simply based on a discussion of the properties of symmetries in quantum mechanics. So if you're just trying to understand, for example, a theory of fundamental particles that is consistent with the theory of special relativity, then what I've listed it here is the set of all possible Hilbert spaces that could be used to describe those fundamental particles. Now, of course, we could dress this up with more complicated data. So for example, you could start talking about charge. And you could say, well, maybe some of these particles have one kind of charge versus another kind of charge. Or we could introduce variations of charge, like color and electroweak charge, um, in order to parameterize their interactions uh, more strongly. And then one could also use the theory of symmetries to constrain the possible Hamiltonian that you would use to describe the interactions of these particles. But what we started with here is really the basic building block uh, from which all of our understanding of particle physics uh, comes from. Now, um, 
this is not a class on particle physics, and so I'm not really going to be discussing any more of this stuff for the rest of this course. Um, but I thought that it was worth spending a lecture or a lecture and a half uh, discussing the representations of the Lorentz group um, because, well, we've already developed the theory of symmetries in quantum mechanics, and it would be a shame uh, not to apply that uh, to some interesting uh, situations. Okay. So, um, as I mentioned, the last week or so of this course will be spent with a discussion of uh, relativistic quantum mechanics in more detail and the Dirac equation, where we'll begin to get at least a bit of a flavor for how um, these theories of particle physics work. Um, but um, uh, this, I think, is as far as we're going to get into the nitty gritty of uh, representations of the Lorentz group. Um, I guess I, I, I should say that I um, appreciate that you know last lecture and the first half of this lecture so far have been a little on the technical side. Um, I'm not asking you to remember, you know, you will not be required um, to recite from memory uh, the uh, algebra of um, the Lorentz transformations. You know, um, I understand that that's a little technical, but I thought it was definitely worth going through. Uh, you will be required to recite from memory um, uh, the Raven by Edgar Allan Poe uh, <laughs> and uh, the SU2 rotation algebra, um, but, uh, uh, but not uh, the Lorentz transformations. Okay. So um, this concludes everything that I want to say about symmetries in quantum mechanics. Um, uh, at this point, um, my goal is to spend about a week studying the theory of time-dependent systems in quantum mechanics, um, which is relevant for a variety of purposes. Um, before I do so, maybe I should stop and see if there are any questions on uh, the general theory of symmetries in quantum mechanics. Yes? Good. Um, um, so when we study the Dirac equation, we'll write down, so yes, um, that's a great answer. That's a great, well, no, that's a great question. Here's a great answer. Okay. Where's, where's the formula I'm looking for? Okay. Let's think about this while spinner here. Okay. So what is n? n is j plus ik. Um, what happens if you forget about k? If you forget about k, then n is equal to j. Okay. And so that means that if you look at, for example, this left-handed spinner, and you think about what happens if you forget about k, well, it's still acted on by this Pauli matrix. Okay. So then you would just take n to be parameterized be equal to j instead of j plus ik. And so representing n by a Pauli matrices, matrix just says you're representing j by that Pauli matrix. Okay. And so that immediately tells you that in the non-relativistic limit, these while spinners should just reduce down to the normal spin one half particles. And um, there's a bit of a subtlety here because I've treated n and n dagger, well, because n is non-unitary, or sorry, is not Hermitian, it's anti-Hermitian. And so I can't directly identify n with j. Okay. So in order to take a non-relativistic limit more carefully, what you would really want to do is you would want to reintroduce your factors of c appearing everywhere. And then you would want to take a limit of your algebra where uh, it's formally it's called the contraction of your algebra, where you would, which is a formal way of forgetting about the boosts. Okay. Um, and so uh, you would need to be a little more careful but just based on what, you've, what we've seen here, you can immediately see, you just forget about the k's and act, ask how the j's act. The fact that n is identified with a Pauli matrix means that j is identified with a Pauli matrix. When we discuss the Dirac equation, we'll see this completely explicitly. Okay. Um, so I've told you how to construct the Hilbert spaces okay, based on the theory of symmetries. In order to really understand the physics, though, we have to write down a Hamiltonian. Okay. And so when I write down the Hamiltonian of these systems, um, we'll be talking about a theory of, um, of spin one-half particles in quantum mechanics. And then we'll be able to take a non-relativistic limit by literally saying, consider those states that are not moving very quickly. Okay. And then you'll literally be able to see that it reduces precisely down to the usual uh, rotation 
rotation uh, stuff that, that you're already familiar with? Uh, that's a very good question. Good. Other questions? Okay. So we're now going to shift gears a little bit. Okay. So in our discussions of quantum mechanics so far, and in particular in our discussion of um, uh, in, in your discussions of quantum mechanics and all of the classes that you've taken so far, you've typically been considering situations where energy is conserved, and in particular, where the Hamiltonian is time independent. However, of course, there are many sorts of quantum mechanical systems that we might be interested in studying where the Hamiltonian has some explicit time dependence. Um, this might happen, for example, if you're studying particles in a magnetic field and you start varying the strength of that magnetic field. Okay. Indeed, that is precisely what you do uh, when you do nuclear magnetic resonance or when if you get an MRI, that's exactly what's happening. There's a time-dependent magnetic field and they're imaging parts of your body by looking at the response of the various uh, particles in your body to that time-dependent magnetic field. Um, and so this is indeed a, a subject that has a great deal of application um, not just in uh, NMR, but in all sorts of areas of physics. Um, essentially, um, the theory of time-dependent systems is also um, the sort of starting point uh, for the theory of scattering processes in quantum mechanics. Um, one way of modeling a scattering process, if you take an electron, which is whizzing by a neutron, um, one way of thinking about that is you could go to the rest frame of the electron and then the neutron is whizzing by, or the nucleus is whizzing by, and you could think of that as subjecting the electron to a time-dependent interaction. So for example, uh, during the time interval when the electron is near the nucleus, it would be subject to a strong force, uh, a strong uh, electric, electromagnetic force. Um, and so you could think of the scattering process of an electron, say, off of a neutron, as some time-independent interaction of the electron with the neutron. Indeed, whenever you study radioactive decay or uh, anything like that in nuclear physics, um, the theory of time-dependent Hamiltonians and time-dependent quantum systems is very relevant. Um, it's also relevant in condensed matter systems. Um, as we'll see, we'll be considering um, later on in this class what are known as adiabatic processes and uh, Berry phase, which are um, core uh, concepts that have been used to understand all sorts of systems in condensed matter physics um, and particle physics. Okay. So that's just um, a few words of uh, motivation. So what is the basic setup? Okay. So let's consider a Hamiltonian that depends on time. Okay. One of the things that we did um, uh, relatively early in this class is write down an explicit, although not particularly useful formula for the unitary time evolution for a general Hamiltonian, the universal time, the unitary time evolution operator that generates time translation even when the Hamiltonian has time dependence. So we wrote it down in terms of uh, the path ordered exponential. Um, what I would like to do in this part of the course is try and bring that down to earth a little bit and use that formalism to uh, say interesting things about specific time dimension, time dependent systems in certain approximations. So in particular, the sort of situation that we're often confronted with in quantum mechanics is one where you have a Hamiltonian that depends on time in such a way that it's equal to some time independent piece, H naught, plus some time dependent piece that I'll call V. So um, for example, if you uh, think about a particle in a time-dependent potential, such as the electron whizzing by a, a nucleus that I described earlier, then V might be literally uh, the potential uh, of the nucleus as seen by the electron as a function of time. But in general, V could be some operator that describes some interactions in the system 
that might be time dependent. So, because we will not assume that the Hamiltonian at two different times uh, commutes with itself, the time evolution operator is quite complicated and it's given by a path ordered exponential. And um, in particular, uh, there is no conserved energy. So, um, uh, of course, uh, because energy is conserved in a system only when you consider all of the parts of the system together. Okay. So, for example, with the uh, uh, case of a magnetic field that's being varied uh, in time to produce some time-dependent Hamiltonian in some, uh, in some material. Uh, of course, total energy is conserved, but if you just look at the Hamiltonian uh, describing uh, the material itself, forgetting about uh, the Hamiltonian of your apparatus creating the magnetic field, then you'll see that uh, apparently an energy will not be conserved because you're pumping energy into the system by varying that magnetic field in time. The other famous example where energy is not conserved is, of course, the universe itself. Um, our universe is not time translation invariant. It is not static. Our universe is expanding. So that means that the true Hamiltonian that describes the evolution of our universe uh, depends on time, and energy is not conserved. Indeed, as we have already seen in our discussion of the time-dependent frequency of a harmonic oscillator, uh, this is what is responsible, in a sense, for um, uh, the presence of matter in the universe. Okay, we've already explained matter in the universe two ways this class. That's pretty impressive. Okay. okay. Our goal then is to develop a theory of these systems which will be useful in the case where that interact, the time dependent part of the Hamiltonian, V of t, is relatively small or is relatively simple. So the way that I would like to begin is I would like to begin by considering the eigenstates of the time independent piece of the Hamiltonian H naught. Then if V of t were equal to zero, there would be nothing left to say. You would just stick the system in one of these energy eigenstates and it would stay there. But if V of t is non-zero, it will lead to transitions between these states. And it is precisely those transitions that we are interested in studying. So let's consider the state at some general time t. So I'll call the state alpha then, of course, one can expand it in this basis of eigenstates of the time-independent piece of the Hamiltonian, n. And so I'll just expand alpha in that basis and call the coefficients in that expansion c sub n. And because the time evolution really, is, there are two pieces in the Hamiltonian responsible for the time evolution, h is h naught plus v of t, what I'll do here is I'll just include in my definition of c sub n an explicit factor here of e to the minus i e n t over h bar. And what is that? That's the part of the time evolution that comes from h naught. So that's the piece of time evolution that coming comes just from H naught. So for example, if V is equal to zero, then all those C sub n's are just gonna be constants in time. And the oscillation, the periodic oscillation, the, the, uh, of that oscillating phase factor um, due to H naught is already factored out. Okay. So this means that we've essentially subtracted off
the time evolution due to H naught. And in fact, this can be regarded as a new picture in quantum mechanics. So um, what do I mean by that? Well, let me re remind you that we usually think about the time evolution in quantum mechanics in the Schrodinger picture. Okay. In the Schrodinger picture, you have states which evolve in time and observables which do not. Whereas in the Heisenberg picture, you have observables which evolve in time and states which do not. Okay. So in particular, um, in the Schrodinger picture, the observables do not in term, do not evolve in time, but the states evolve in time as determined by the Hamiltonian, whereas in the Heisenberg picture, states do not evolve in time, but observables evolve as, or operators evolve as determined by the Hamiltonian. And so by subtracting off in our description of states, the time evolution due to H naught, but not to V, what we're really doing is int introducing a new picture, which is usually called the interaction picture, where the evolution of the states is determined by part of the Hamiltonian, namely by V, and the evolution of the observables is determined by H naught. So there's no rule that says that you have to take either the Heisenberg picture or the Schrodinger picture. You could always take something in between and divide your Hamiltonian into two pieces uh, and think of states evolving with respect to one part of the Hamiltonian and observables evolving with respect to the other part of the Hamiltonian. And this is just a convenient thing to do if, for example, you have a small perturbation to your Hamiltonian V, and you want to try and understand the effects of that perturbation um, systematically. So in this so-called interaction picture, um, just as we can define Heisenberg picture observables in terms of Schrodinger picture observables. If you have some observable A, some operator A, then its value at time t is related to its value at time zero. By conjugation, by that unitary operator that generates time translations due to H naught. And because H naught is time independent, that's very easy to write down. It's just the phase factor, e to the i H naught t over H bar. And here A sub s is the usual Schrodinger picture observable. So it's the time independent operator that we usually take to describe the uh, some observable in quantum mechanics. And states in the interaction picture are going to be related to states in the Schrodinger picture, again, by the action of this operator, e to the i h naught t divided by h bar. Okay. So of course, if v were equal to 0, then this is exactly what you would call the Heisenberg picture. So the only difference between this and the Heisenberg picture is that instead of taking the full Hamiltonian here, when I perform these uh, uh, conjugations, I'm only taking the time independent part of the Hamiltonian. Question, yes? No, it's an H naught, okay. The reason here, let me, um, I'm gonna do a, a, a short calculation um, in just a second, which will make it clear exactly why that is, okay. 
Good, good question, though, yes. Um, let's put it this way. A, a quick way of seeing why it has to be this is that when you set V equals to 0, this should be precisely the Heisenberg picture. Okay? And indeed, when V is equal to 0, this is the usual formula for Heisenberg picture. Okay. Now, of course, as is usual, for the actual calculation of the outcome of some experiment, you always, you never consider the operator itself, you always take its matrix element between two states. And so in that, of course, as you can see, all of these exponentials just cancel out. Okay. So as far as the outcome of some measurement, as far as the physics goes, it doesn't matter what picture I'm working in. This is just a convenient bookkeeping piece to keep track of things. Yes? Wait, uh so remember that the Heisenberg picture is the one where we take states to be time independent and uh, operators to evolve in time by conjugation. So in the Heisenberg picture, so how does alpha sub s evolve in time? It evolves according to the Schrodinger equation, meaning that it's acted on by the unitary time evolution operator e to the minus i h naught t divided by h bar as a function of time, which will cancel that factor here. Let me write this out a little, let me um, work out this in a little bit uh, more detail, okay, which I think will make this uh, a, a bit clearer. So let's just take the time derivative of this interaction picture state, okay? So what is this? This is i h bar d by dt of e to the i h naught t over h bar times the usual Schrodinger picture state. So that's the sum of two terms, okay? The first term comes from where the time derivative hits this guy. So what do you get? You get minus h naught times e to the i h naught t over h bar times alpha sub s plus e to the i h naught t over h bar times the time derivative of alpha, alpha sub s, and that's just the Hamiltonian, h naught plus v, acting on alpha sub s. And you can see here that this term will cancel that term. So you get e to the i h naught t over h bar times v times alpha s. And here, v is really uh, the Schrodinger picture operator v. If you define the interaction picture operator v as e to the i h naught t over h bar times v Schrodinger, or which we just called v, so V here just denotes V Schrodinger times E to the minus I H naught T over H bar. Then this equation says that I H bar D by DT of the interaction picture state is equal to V I times E to the minus i h naught, oops, sorry, uh, e to the i h naught t over h bar times alpha s. And this, of course, is nothing more than the interaction picture state. That's the definition of the interaction picture state. So we see that the interaction picture state obeys a Schrodinger equation, but not the full Schrodinger equation involving the Hamiltonian h naught plus v, but only the uh, partial Schrodinger equation involving v, but not h naught. So in other words, let me remind you that we started out this discussion by taking our state alpha in the Schrodinger picture and expanding it in terms of the basis n, 
of eigenstates of our time-independent part of the Hamiltonian H0. And all this interaction picture is doing is it's saying that alpha i is equal to that same sum. So you sum over these coefficients n, c, you sum over the states n times the coefficient cn, now without this uh, set of phase factors. So for example, if v is equal to 0, alpha i is time independent, and those constants cn uh, will be time independent. Or, to put it another way, cn of t is equal to the overlap between n and the state in interaction picture. So this formula allows us to easily determine the uh, a way easily to determine these uh, CNs at least formally. To see this, let's take the time derivative of this equation. So let's take I H bar d by dt of CN. So you combining uh, taking this equation, taking the time derivative of that, and using this version of Schrodinger's equation in the interaction picture, we see that this is the sum over n, or uh, let me call it the sum over m, just to, okay. Let me rewrite this a little bit more explicitly. This is i h bar d by dt of the overlap between n and alpha i, which I'll write as the sum over m, cm of t times m. Or let, actually, no, let me not write it that way. What is this? Sorry. This is i h bar times uh, the overlap of n with the time derivative of alpha i, which using that above equation is the overlap of n with v i times alpha i. And then using our definition of alpha i, this is going to be the sum over m of the overlap between n and v times the state m in the interaction picture. Or in the Schrodinger picture, this is the sum over m, uh, I'm sorry, times cm, cm of t from this equation. So that's that piece right there. Okay. So here in this equation, I'm just using the fact that alpha i is the sum over m times cm m. So this is the sum over m times cm times e to the i e n minus e m t over h bar times the matrix element of v in the Schrodinger picture between n and m. Okay. So i h bar, so this is the equation that we're seeking, which allows us to determine the, trans the uh, coefficient cn as a function of time. So I haven't done anything particularly fancy here. All I've done is basically uh, taken our Schrodinger equation in terms of the Hamiltonian h equals h naught plus v, and I've reorganized it slightly. I've worked in terms of the basis of states n, which are eigenstates of h naught, and I'm treating v as some perturbation which allows us to determine the time evolution of these coefficients C sub n. So um, there's a typical notation that people use when writing down this equation. Okay. So typically, we abbreviate these matrix elements of the operator V 
we call them V sub n m, and that phase factor E n minus E m divided by h bar has dimensions of one over time, so we'll call it omega sub n m because that's going to be interpreted as a frequency. And then the equation which determines these coefficients c is i h bar c n dot is equal to the sum over m v n m e to the i omega n m t times c m. Or, if you want to think about this as a matrix differential equation, you could think of the C's as a column vector. And then this just says that C dot is M times C, where M is the following matrix the one whose elements along the diagonal are just uh, the matrix are just the diagonal elements of V as a matrix, and then the off-diagonal elements have these extra phases. And M is a Hermitian matrix. as can be proven pretty easily just by using the hermeticity of the Hamiltonian and hence of the operator V. Um, are there any questions on this? Um, I hope it's clear that I haven't actually done very much uh, here. All I've done is I've rewritten Schrodinger's equation, but I've rewritten it in a way that will allow us to um, understand uh, uh, at least quite explicitly, transitions between states due to the inter introduction of a time-dependent piece of the Hamiltonian. Maybe I should pause here and see if there are any questions. I could have done all of this, I should mention, without introducing the interaction picture, but the interaction picture is something that we very commonly see in quantum mechanics, especially in um, scattering theory. So I've taken the opportunity here to, to phrase things in terms of the interaction picture, uh, just so that uh, in your future lives as physicists, you'll uh, recognize that when you see it. So um, what I'd like to do now, um, although probably not immediately, is essentially spend um, the next lecture working out uh, the implications of this formalism and uh, several examples of interesting time-dependent systems. Uh, so, for example, we'll understand the quantum mechanical version of the driven harmonic oscillator. So, a harmonic oscillator is an oscillator where you act on it with an additional force that is uh, dependent on time. And so, we'll be able to understand the quantum mechanical version of this, uh, which indeed is responsible for NMR. Um, and then, we'll move into a discussion of uh, things that are a bit closer to the spirit of scattering theory. Uh, we'll learn uh, what's known as Fermi's Golden Rule. Uh, have you guys seen that before, Fermi's Golden Rule? I thought you hadn't seen time-dependent system. Have you seen this before? No. How have you seen Fermi's Golden Rule? In what context did you see Fermi's Golden Rule? Oh, you, you, you weren't in under, undergrad here, of course. Okay. You saw it in modern physics. Interesting. Okay, good. Um, okay, well, I'll see you guys next Wednesday then. Um, and just a reminder, um, uh,